Welcome to Brain Chat with the Nerdy Neurologist. I'm Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams, and I'm your board certified neurologist and MS specialist. My mission is to engage, educate, and empower those affected by MS to become an active part of their healthcare team. Here on Brain Chat, we'll be talking all things MS, health and wellness, advocacy, and we'll throw a little bit of music and music therapy in there as well. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned for the next episode. All right, friends, welcome to Brain Chat. It's Dr. Mitzi, your board certified neurologist and MS specialist. And I am so excited to share another Monday night uh, with you guys talking about multiple sclerosis. And tonight we have a very, very exciting conversation. We are talking about comorbidity. So I'm really excited about the guests that I have tonight. And I know that you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation. So I thought that this was really important for us to discuss because since the pandemic started, everybody's been throwing around this word comorbidities, right? We talk about it in relation to COVID, in relation to increased risk for outcomes with COVID, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these comorbidities that we talk about, I want to talk specifically about how they apply to MS and what we've learned about comorbidities or other conditions and the increased risk for MS, as well as the outcomes related to MS. And most importantly, what you can do to help yourself and to empower yourself and to deal with some of these comorbidities so that you can have the best outcomes possible with multiple sclerosis. All right. So why don't you guys drop in the chat? You know how we do on Brain Chat. You already know. I already see some guys putting in where they're from. Someone's um, logging in from Washington State. Thank you so much for tuning in. Drop in the chat where you're logging in from so I can give you a shout out um, and welcome you uh, to our podcast tonight. All right. So I'm going to start by introducing our special guests. All right. So I'm going to start with Dr. Ellen Mori. She is a professor of neurology and epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University. She completed undergrad in biology at Georgetown and med school at the University of Rochester. Chester. She did a neurology. Uh, she did her internship, neurology residency and fellowship. Sorry, I got some music in here somewhere. All right. Little Stevie Wonder never hurt anybody. Okay. All right. Let's turn off Stevie. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So let me start over. Dr. Mori. All right. She's a neuro professor of neurology and epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. Um, she did her internship neurology residency at University of Pennsylvania and a fellowship in MS, as well as a master's degree in clinical research at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research focuses on environmental factors that influence the risk and prognosis or outcome of multiple sclerosis, as well as improving outcome measures for use in the clinic and in clinical trials. So this is right on time. She is a principal investigator of several trials, including one related to vitamin D, um, as well as cognitive impairment and also traditional versus early aggressive therapy in multiple sclerosis. She is the co-director of the Johns Hopkins MS Precision Medicine Center of Excellence. So we're very, very excited to have her on. I'm going to bring her up in just a moment. And we have Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, who is a longtime friend of mine, um, as well as one of my sorority sisters, my line sister. So we go way, way back. And so Dr. Stanford practices and teaches at Mass General or Har in Harvard Medical School and is one of the first fellowship trained obesity medicine physicians in the world. So she is an expert to talk about obesity specifically which is a comorbidity that is related to multiple sclerosis. She received her BS and MPH from Emory University, and uh, she received her medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia um, School of Medicine, and she also received an MPH H from Harvard Kennedy School of Government as a Zuckerman Fellow in the Harvard Center for Public Leadership. She completed her obesity medicine and nutrition fellowship at Massachusetts General Harvard Medical School after finishing internal medicine residency and pediatrics residency at the University of South Carolina. She has many, many accolades. She is an amazing person. She's worked uh, as a health communications fellow at the CDC, as well as a behavioral sciences intern at the American Cancer Society. 
Society. Um, she also most recently was selected for the Obesity Society Clinician of the Year Award in 2020. And in 2021, she will be awarded the American Medical Association's Dr. Edmund and Rima Kabibi um, Dedication to the Profession Award, which re recognizes a physician who demonstrates active and productive improvement to the profession of medicine through community service, advocacy, leadership, teaching, or philanthropy. So we're going to welcome our guests to the stage. Welcome, Dr. Mori, and welcome, Dr. Cody Stanford. Thanks for having us. So Absolutely. happy to be here. Absolutely. All right. So before we get started, I see some folks are logging in. We've got some folks from Atlanta, my hometown, where we've got some storms going around. We got some folks from Albany, um, Montgomery, Alabama, Birmingham, D.C., South Jersey, uh, New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey, San Antonio, Texas. Um, and let's see. I think that's it. Okay. And then everybody else is just saying hi. All right. Very good. Well, let's get into this discussion. I'm so excited. We got so much to talk about tonight, ladies. All right. So first, let's talk a little bit about what comorbidities are. So as I said, we've been throwing this word around since the pandemic started, right? Co comorbidities put you at increased risk. What are comorbidities and how do they affect our overall health? So I guess I'll jump in here. Um, when we when we hear comorbidities, we have to think of this disease as related to this disease, another disease, and it causes an increased risk. Um, so for example, if we're looking at something like obesity, what things cause an increased risk of unfortunately sickness, what we call morbidity or mortality associated with whatever that additional risk factor is. Um, and so those, you know, so you can hear it, like you said, from a vantage point of like whatever the primary disease of focus is, right? Um, tonight we have some of our, our really esteemed neurologists here. So the focus is multiple sclerosis and what diseases that are associated with multiple sclerosis increase your risk of number one, having the disease, your risk of increased sickness associated with that disease process. And then unfortunately um, for, you know, for, sometimes we'll hear it as it relates to greater mortality and or death. And so that's the best way I think, or the simplest way to think about it in terms of when we say this idea of comorbidities in relation to whatever disease, what increases your risk of diagnoses, um, you know, greater sickness, and then unfortunately death. Absolutely. And I think that's so important because, you know, one of the things that I stress to my patients, number one, when, when they get diagnosed with MS is that everything is not the MS, right? And people with MS do get other conditions, right? So it's important not just to follow with your neurologist, but to also have a primary care physician because hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, all those things can still happen if someone has MS. And so we have to keep control of those so that we don't necessarily affect the course of MS. So Dr. Mori, can you tell us a little bit more about how these comorbidities can affect the risk for MS and possibly some of the outcomes? Definitely. I think uh, some of these comorbidities still require quite a bit of study for people with MS, but um, there's been a long recognition for MS that especially looking at risk, it's not all about your genetics. So people ask, you know, am I going to pass this on to my child because I have an MS diagnosis? And I remind them if they had an identical twin, so they shared all of their genes with another person, that person's risk of developing MS in their lifetime would only be about 30%. So there are a lot of other things that contribute to whether or not a person gets MS in their life, which is why it's sort of important to think about what are those other factors that aren't related necessarily directly to one's genetics. And there have been a few uh, things that are considered comorbidities that might be related to increased risk of developing MS. And overall, we think about cigarette smoking as relevant possibly vitamin D status, although I think uh, the jury's still out on that and whether that risk is actually the same in all populations. And then finally, obesity has emerged as a potentially important comorbidity that may influence the risk of developing multiple sclerosis. 
Yeah. So I think that's so important because one of the first things that people always ask, um, you know, when they come in the office, when they're diagnosed, what can I do to help myself? Are there things that I can do to improve my health? The converse of that is sometimes people also ask, what did I do wrong to get MS? And although these are risk factors, as you said, it's very complex, right? So genetics plays a part. Environment plays a part. These comorbidities play a part. So you we can't necessarily say just because you smoke cigarettes, you got MS or because because you are overweight, you got MS, but certainly taking care of our overall health can not only decrease the risk for MS, but also improve our outcomes. So let's talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about a couple of these comorbidities, and then we'll talk separately about obesity and we'll kind of pause there. But let's talk a little bit about, um, let's start with vitamin D, right? Vitamin D is one of those hot topics. One conference we go to, vitamin D is everything. The next conference we go to, vitamin D is not important. This conference, it's this. So just tell us a little bit, since especially since you're, um, you know, the primary investigator for a trial related to MS and vitamin D. Tell us a little bit about our understanding of vitamin D and what we should be doing, um, you know, to maintain our vitamin D levels or how they affect MS overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think vitamin D is a hot topic. And it's one of the first things I enjoyed studying in people with MS. Uh, there were several uh, early studies that suggested a possible role for low vitamin D as an MS risk factor. First, just sort of ecological studies. People observed that MS was less common the closer people lived to the equator. And so they said, well, what else varies with where you are on the latitudinal scale? And they said, you know, sun exposure. And then what relates to sun exposure? Well, most of our vitamin D, unless we're popping supplements, actually comes from exposure of the sun uh, to the sun. And the vitamin D is manufactured in the skin. And that's where the vitamin D story sort of got started in MS. Um, and there are a number of studies looking at this and saying, yeah, people with MS, um, you know, have lower vitamin D levels than people without MS. But then people said, well, you know, folks with MS don't really like the sun. It makes them feel hot and tired. And so maybe it's just because they have MS and you're measuring it too late. And then there were some studies that tried to capture blood samples from people before they developed MS and did show, you know, even five years prior to the first onset of symptoms of MS, vitamin D levels were a bit lower in those who did go on to develop MS compared to people who never did. Um, it's really important to point out, I think, that 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 still could be like a reverse causation. We know that people with MS have a long period of time before they have classic neurological symptoms where stuff is feeling a little off and there can be a lag in diagnosis. And it still could be that avoidance of sun is something that comes kind of early in that prodromal phase. Also of interest, I think, is that more recent data have looked at uh, more representative populations than those early st uh, studies did. Um, the early studies really only included white individuals living with multiple sclerosis and where they found this association. And it's relevant because, of course, skin pigment actually uh, prevents some of the UV from actually getting into the skin and converting uh, the pre-vitamin D uh, in the skin down the pathway towards making vitamin D. And there are two really seminal studies that demonstrated that in Black or African-American individuals and people who identify as Hispanic or Latinx, that link between low vitamin D level and subsequent MS risk may not be as strong. And it calls kind of into question the whole bit of science. And maybe there's something about sun exposure, or maybe it was just this sort of false uh, association um, mm -hmm. that, you know, I think that there's still a lot of work to be done there, but it, it definitely calls uh, into recognition the importance also of studying it in a much more representative and rigorous population. Absolutely. And then there are also questions, are we checking the right test when we're checking vitamin D, right? So in other populations, should we be checking another subset of vitamin D? You know, I think there's a lot of work um, that needs to be done in that space. But certainly, you know, kind of the rule of thumb for many of us in the space and many of us in medicine in general, is if it's low, we replace it, but we don't have enough information to say that everybody should just take vitamin D. Um, I think this has also been a hot topic during COVID because a lot of people have been taking vitamin D supplementation um, during COVID as well, because there were some you know, anecdotal reports that it may help outcomes as well. Is there anything you want to add about vitamin D and the general population? Yeah, you know, 
Absolutely. I think, you know, vitamin D won't hurt you, you know, so having right. adequate vitamin D is not a bad thing. So if you happen to be on supplements and are confused about whether or not, you know, it will or will not help you with regards to X disease, because this has been studied, I think, widely with a lot of diseases, I, you know, we're talking about MS, obesity. Um, we do know that patients with obesity do on on average have significantly lower vitamin Ds and the factors there, in addition to um, what was pointed out by Dr. Maori is, um, you know, when you're looking at adipose or fat tissue, you can imagine that there's, it's harder to get through the skin um, if you have more mass, right? Um, but there's other reasons that we, you know, posit as to why vitamin D deficiency is more prevalent in those that have excess weight. Um, and so, you know, the thing is it won't hurt you, you know, are we going to get into a situation of people having, oh, you know, excessive vitamin D levels? That is not something that we typically see. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, on, to err on the side of caution, and since it has been proven beneficial in some disease um, statuses with really, you know, definitive confirmatory evidence, then, you know, why not just make sure that we're supplemented appropriately? Absolutely. And I think I may have met one patient in my whole career who had a normal vitamin D that was not <laughs> on supplementation. I mean, they may have been from California, like a surfer or something like that. But literally, I have never met a person with a normal vitamin D level who was not taking supplementation. And I had a couple that were overdosing where it was like, off the charts, like they couldn't measure it. So we had to back down. So we get a little bit of that more with B12 than vitamin D, but still, yeah. you know, so just make sure if you're taking supplementation that you're following up with your physician to have them check your levels to make sure that whatever you're doing is adequate and make sure that you're not, you're not getting too much. So excellent discussion about vitamin D. I know that's a hot topic. What about smoking? So let's talk about smoking, right? You know, so interestingly enough, when I was in med school, the rule of thumb was if you had any test question that had a risk factor on it, if smoking was on there, if you mark it nine times out of 10, <laughs> you'd be correct, right? As a risk yeah. factor for many, many diseases. And we often associate it with lung disease, right? But there are studies that suggest that smoking, nicotine specifically, because now I get lots of questions about smoking other things besides cigarettes, right? Um, but nicotine specifically can potentially increase the risk for um, MS and also speed the, the transition from uh, relapsing MS to secondary progressive MS. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Dr. Mowry? Yeah, definitely. I agree. Uh, that is the one thing that, you know, you're always like, oh, I know one thing I can make advice about. Absolutely. Right. Uh, right. But you're absolutely right. It has been linked not only with the risk of MS, but also having more frequent relapses and a greater risk of long-term problems from MS. And, you know, I think there are probably many factors by which smoking may play a role. It likely increases inflammation just in general in the body. Um, and so that can, of course, increase the risk of relapses and new white spots and things like that. But my suspicion also is that one mechanism in folks with MS that it, it creates long-term problems is by creating a metabolic dysfunction over time, small strokes in the brain, other things that may not even be that specific to MS. But if you have MS and it's done some damage to the brain, and of course, as we get older, you know, we also uh, have our brain sort of shrinking a little bit with time. And then you start adding in the smoking, which increases the risk of big and small little strokes over the brain. You know, all these things can kind of compound and accelerate the clinical effects of the damage that's going on in the brain. Um, there was that really interesting study from Sweden, I think, several years years ago that looked at like how people get their nicotine in Sweden. I, they use a lot of snuff also like oral snuff. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. demonstrated that, that that actually sort of counterbalanced people who use that in a little bit of cigarette smoking didn't really have that increased risk. It really was people who were inhaling the cigarette smoke. And mm. you wonder if there's something, you know, we talk a lot in MS about the gut microbiome and how the bacteria in the gut can interact with the immune system to set off autoimmune diseases. But I think, you know, there's also a lot of interest in the the lung microbiome and in the, you know, bacteria in the airway and the immune system in the airway and does cigarette smoking cause an irritation there that also also leads to immune system activation. I think a lot, a lot of work to be done, but uh, but the test question answer will still be stop smoking. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's something very important to counsel our patients about. You know, I think I also counsel people, especially with smoking and obesity, you know, with mm -hmm. um 
what's the word that I want to use with some humility, because it's not as easy as it seems, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic. People are dealing mm -hmm. with many, many stressors. People maybe who had given up certain habits may have picked them back up. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to counsel people, to give them the information, you know, but certainly to give them also a little bit of grace because everybody's having some difficulty, um, especially with, um, you know, the stress from COVID and those COVID pounds. So let's mm -hmm. switch gears and let's park a little bit on obesity. All right. Absolutely. So Dr. Stanford, tell us kind of what is some of the most current knowledge and understanding about, you know, obesity as a disease, right? You know, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. as you just can't stop eating cupcakes, right. you know, tell us a little bit about right. it and a little bit about the work that you do. Absolutely. First of all, I think you brought up a great question is that you framed it exactly the way I would want you to is to recognize that obesity is an actual disease. It's not just aesthetically how we appear or if we can wear the bikini we want to wear because we're coming out of COVID and we want to finally get to the beach. That has nothing to do with obesity. So obesity is a disease that's actually regulated by the brain. Um, so if we were to slice my brain straight down the middle and get to that part that you see kind of in the middle of my head and just go straight back to there, there's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is getting signals from different parts of our body, our fat tissue, which we call adipose um, tissue, our large intestine, our small intestine, our pancreas and our stomach. And it sends signals back to our brain to tell us not only how much to eat, it also tells it how much to store. So notice nowhere in there did I say anything about willpower. That is literally how your brain signals to tell your body to be in a certain area. Now, does this mean that like I don't pay attention to one's diet or physical activity? No, but a lot of those are even influenced by how the brain signals. My desire to be active, my desire to be inactive, that can be largely influenced by these signaling pathways. And when patients tend to struggle with excess weight, they're typically signaling down a pathway of the brain and don't you guys don't have to remember this, I do, but it's called the goody related peptide pathway, which causes lower formation of something we call BDNF, which is brain derived neurotropic factor. If you have low levels of that, you phenotypically, meaning how you look, expresses that you have excess weight. Whereas people that are lean have high levels of it and they can go and eat a box of donuts, i.e. my husband, and then still be 160 <laughs> pounds and six feet tall. I he wish you he were here listening to me because he would look at me with a frown <laughs> on his face, but he's not here. So if he doesn't but the go back aerobics and helps also. Later. The aerobics you guys do helps also. <laughs> yeah. So I have it been to help. an aerobics class yeah. with you and your husband and it is very intense. Like I had very to take intense. several breaks in the back and sit down. <laughs> you guys are very intense on the we workout are regimen. Intense. We are intense. And that's really good. So that activity piece, right, is great for weight maintenance. But unfortunately, the messaging that we as docs often serve to patients is, oh, go exercise to lose weight. That's really the wrong message to be selling. Because on average, mm -hmm. most people don't lose a lot of weight from activity. They maintain their weight which is also good. So even if you're at, let's say 300 pounds, 300 is not 350. If we can maintain you here, it may not be where you want it to be, but what we can do to keep that you from that weight gain. So you brought up an important question. You talked about weight gain and COVID. Um, and so there was this big study that came out in the American Psychological Association about two to three weeks ago that said on average, US adults gained 29 pounds during the pandemic. That was average. Mm -hmm. Millennials actually average was like 41 pounds from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so you were like, gosh, and everybody, and then the, the whole thing that's been out in the news is like, oh my gosh, it's because people weren't moving. Okay, that was probably a contribution, but I think what you said earlier, Dr. Williams, was actually much more important. The stress associated with the pandemic led to deposition of adipose. Adipose, again, you guys remember adipose is a fancy word for fat. But when we have stress, we have an increase in inflammation in our body characterized by different inflammatory markers. And what that tells our brain to do is to store fat. Stress mm -hmm. in our historical development, if we think about anthropology as we went, went from you know, non-human primates to primates and et cetera, stress usually meant that a famine was coming, okay? And so our bodies went to go store to defend against the famine that was coming. The problem now is the famine doesn't come, right? So the famine is not there. We have food insecurity, which is another story we can talk about a little later. But the whole point is, is that the stress, this idea that during this pandemic, regardless of who you are, regardless of your race or ethnicity, your socioeconomic class, all of us went underwent and still maybe are undergoing such significant stress that, that caused our body to want to hold on to more of that. 
And so is that your fault that the pandemic happened? I wouldn't say it is your fault. Was it is your mm -hmm. fault that you have more stress associated with pandemic? I would say no. I mean, this is something that no one has experienced during their lifetime that's listening to diet or will listen in the future. We had our bodies went into storage mode. It went into storage mode. Maybe we, there was a less activity plus that plus the stress. I mean, it was just a recipe for disaster. And so unfortunately, what we do know about obesity and COVID is that we talked about obesity being a chronic inflammatory condition. And we know that COVID is an acute inflammatory condition and those don't play very well together in the playground. And so what we do know is the number one risk factor for death for people under the age of 60, so 60 and below is obesity from COVID. Um, three to four times as high as likelihood for those that don't have obesity. So a major risk factor um, and something that I pay very close attention to obviously as someone who exclusively cares for patients with obesity. Yeah. I mean, that's such good information. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. I mean, just, yeah, I know, so you know, this transition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but everything you said was good. It's just this yeah. transition of thinking about obesity as, um, you know, a disease versus a lack of willpower. And it's so interesting that you said that because I used to have all these conversations with friends, you know, and I have one friend, let's say, who, you know, maybe drank too much, you know, and mm -hmm. I'd be like, dude, just stop drinking, you know, and then. <laughs> If I wanted to stop eating and lose weight, they're like, well, dude, just stop eating. Right. You know, but it's not that simple. You know, it's very sure. good for people to understand that there are signals, you know, telling our brains to do certain things. Um, and so, Dr. Mulry, talk a little bit about how obesity um, affects MS risk as well as potentially MS outcome. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Cody Stanford, that's a really um, awesome <laughs> synopsis, and I feel like I'm going to learn a lot from you uh, as as you keep talking. So, um, you know, we started studying obesity in folks with MS and people who developed MS, and then later to look at it as a an outcome uh, predictor. Um, not that long ago, actually. And the first studies that I thought were really clever looked at people. Uh, throughout their lifespan and, and how they gained weight and their weight changed over time and saw that people who were obese, especially in sort of the late teen years, were those who seemed to carry the most extra risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Um, of course, for you and I, when we are already meeting people who've been diagnosed with MS, we want to know which of these factors that are associated with risk of the disease continue on as risk factors for outcomes. Um, is it something that continues to be worth chasing? Or is it something that we say, well, unfortunately, that happened, but, you know, we can move on and, and think about other stuff. And it does seem that obesity, at least when we study people over time, is linked with worse outcomes for people with MS. You know, we looked at, for example, shrinkage of the brain over time and saw that people who were obese, particularly those who are very obese, um, were much more likely to have accelerated damage and shrinkage of their brain, which is one of the biggest long-term sort of markers of, yeah, you're going to have physical disabilities down the road from your multiple sclerosis. Lots of work done from Canada and elsewhere looking at um, what we call obesity related illnesses. So diabetes and high blood pressure and illnesses like that demonstrating people with MS who carry those extra diagnoses much more likely to become disabled by their MS over time. I still think we have a lot of work to do though to figure out, well, what is, how's that operating? Is it like there's something specific about how those illnesses affect MS and then it accelerates MS or are they just adding and contributing to some of the damage that MS is doing to the brain and the nervous Nervous system and causing independent avenues of damage that nonetheless kind of accelerate the whole process of neurologic problems. Um, and so hopefully <laughs> we'll be able to sort some of that out. And I think another area that we have to work on is exactly what you were both just talking about. How do we frame our messaging as physicians so that we don't make our patients feel guilty or bad about it, uh, but that we can make sure that they get the help they need to make the changes uh, necessary to combat some of these um, conditions. Yeah. And I think, you know, what both of you said is so important. And I think the other piece that is missing is that sometimes or that we haven't addressed yet is that sometimes with these other comorbid conditions, it makes it more difficult to figure out what is the MS versus what is this other condition? You know, I kind of describe it as this never ending cycle. Right. You know, 
Someone may have some numbness in their leg. Is it diabetic neuropathy? Is it related to their MS? Is it a combination of both of these things? You know, and so it can be very difficult sometimes, especially if people have had these conditions for a long time or the conditions are not well controlled. You know, what can we, you know, how do we figure out what part of it's the MS versus what part is related to these other conditions? And again, very, very important. Um, and I stress to all of my patients that you do need to have a primary care physician, you know, um, because you do need to have regular screenings. You do need to have somebody monitoring you and following you and helping to address these issues um, for your overall health. And so as we're kind of on the 30 minute mark here, I want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about what we can do, right? One of the things that's most important to me um, as a provider and is one of the reasons why I started this podcast and why I do much of the education that I do is because I want people to feel empowered. I want people to know what they can do to help themselves. You know, certainly MS is a condition where many people may feel hopeless. Um, you know, there's this uh, thought that, you know, there's not much we can do about MS because we it doesn't have a cure. But whenever someone tells me that, I said, well, name five diseases for me that have a cure. <laughs> right. We manage it. Right. We manage it like we manage other conditions. We have a little bit more at stake because we're talking about your brain and your spine, but we manage it like we manage other things. So what are some tips that we can give people um, first? Well, first, let's talk about it from a healthcare provider, because I know I have some colleagues here in the um, that are on the podcast. What can we say to our colleagues about how we approach the management of obesity and how we approach managing some of these risk factors to help people. And I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Cody Stanford. Absolutely. So first of all, with obesity, just first of all, we have to know that it's a disease. And unfortunately, we as doctors received minimal education about how to treat the most None. prevalent chronic disease. Right. I know because I just published several papers, but I was trying to be nice. <laughs> um, None. I published help a paper us. that came help out us. in the International <laughs> Journal of Obesity just a year ago where I looked at what medical students, residents and fellows throughout the entire world receive in terms of training. And let me tell you, no country is doing a good job of educating any person. So you can't be like, oh, Sweden does a great job. No, we have no countries. I just published a paper that came out just a week and a half ago in the journal of the National Medical Association looking at coverage of obesity on all of the medical board examination, neurology, pediatrics, internal medicine, surgery. Nobody does a good job. And so that means none of your doctors know anything about it. First of all, number one is his disease. The language we use when we're talking about the disease can be extremely important in terms of promoting weight bias and stigma. So there are a few words I want everyone that's listening to cancel from your vocabulary. So just cancel it. We're like, we're trying to cancel COVID. We're going to cancel these words. Number one, obese. Canceled. Okay. Obesity is a disease. When we label someone as obese, that can be highly stigmatizing, inflammatory, and usually makes people want to fight you. So we can say a patient with mild, moderate, or severe obesity, right? So we're gonna get rid of the word obese. Morbid as it relates to obesity, so morbid obesity. It's really interesting that we use morbid to define obesity, meaning greater sickness associated with obesity, but we don't do that with MS, morbid MS. We don't call it morbid MS or morbid COVID or morbid heart disease or morbid cancer. And so just the language that we use surrounding this disease is highly inflammatory and it's built into how we even code as docs. You can go and search for morbid obesity, it's there. You can go for, mm -hmm. for obese, that's there. These things are so inflammatory and are based on our lack of knowledge. Like you said, the zero education that we receive is docs. So number one, number two, just like you talked about MS being a chronic disease, we don't cure obesity. So I can send you to bariatric surgery and improve greatly your level of severe obesity. And may, maybe you come down to mild obesity, maybe you don't have obesity anymore, but it doesn't just go away. Let me tell you, your brain remembers your set point. OK, mm -hmm. and so if your set point was 300 pounds before surgery, yes, we bring you and let's say we bring you to, to 195 and you're feeling really good at that level. Let me tell you, it doesn't stay there. The brain has those hormones that are trying to bring you back to your set point. And so then that means you need chronic care, much like you don't leave your neurologist when you have MS. Don't leave your obesity medicine physician if that's who you're seeing or if you have a primary care doctor or someone else that has special training in obesity that can help he treat that chronic disease of obesity, then that's important. Now, let me tell you, and you guys know this, if a person comes in with untreated diabetes and I tell them to go home and just eat less and, and exercise and lose, you know, lose weight, I would lose my medical license. 
If someone came in with a blood pressure of 220 over one, I don't know, 30, and I say, oh, you know what, just go home, eat a little less salt and just exercise and eat less and exercise, exercise more or something. I would lose my license. <laughs> These are all things that would happen if I send someone home with severe, poorly treated diabetes or uh, hypertension, which is high blood pressure. But I am well within my purview. If I send a patient home that weighs 550 pounds, I'm like, you know what? You really need to just drink skim milk and you drink a little bit more water and then you go on some more walks. I That's fine. It's accepted. Oh, yeah, yeah. you're getting you're really being tough. It so shows true. you how we do and how we treat our patients. Now, I do not believe in there being a number that you have to reach. And actually, the BMI listen, table. Listen. Chart, I was just I was going, just about to oh, say, tell me about too. that chart. Tell me about yeah. the chart. How accurate so of is the course chart? I published the way I, published, I should be on the yeah. chart. I look sick. So like, <laughs> no, no. Like, so the thing is, is that, that's why that I never give I my 10. patients. Yeah, no, I never give my patients a target number. And any of them that happen to be listening, if you're listening, they can, they will, they will support this. They keep asking me, but what's the number? What's the number, Dr. Tamara? I'm like, you know, I'm not going to give you a number. I've been seeing for 10 years. I'm not going to give you a number because every single person, you have to personalize it to them. Every single person has their ideal. And so we get you to your happiest, healthiest weight for you, not you next to your sister or to your your brother or to your cousin, to you, unless you have an identical twin, then we do want to get you guys close <laughs> together, okay? So those are the identical twins that are listening because I know there's some of them out there because some of them told me they were coming. Um, so yeah, we want to get you guys <laughs> similar, okay? But everybody else, right? Everybody else, it's all about getting it to you. So what that means is that we know that obesity is a disease, treating it, seeing how you respond to whatever therapy, whether it's behavior or lifestyle modification, whether it's medication, endoscopic therapy, surgery, where does your body bring you to? And where? And then we see where see what that is. And how do you look? How do you feel? How do your other risk factors seem? That's what I'm looking for. So for example, I have a patient that started out with me for with 550 pounds. We got him down to 300 pounds and that's where his body seems to be happy. He's maintained that for the last five years. That's his happy, healthy place. And that's fine. So I don't go and judge, oh, he's 300 pounds. He didn't work hard enough. We got 250 pounds off of this guy and maintained it. That's his happy place. He feels comfortable. He's able to do everything he's able to do. His entire parameter of cholesterol and blood pressure, gorgeous, stunning. So that's his best place for him. So does does that make sense? Hopefully I, I explained yeah, that. Yeah, so it, it really is very yeah. similar to yeah. MS. So I always right. say that my MS patients are like Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Everybody's got their own <laughs> secret recipe, right? And That's so weird. when you find that secret recipe that worked for that person, you know, you yeah, know, you it. just, you stick with it, right? If it ain't broke, don't That's fix so funny it. that you just can't. <laughs> I don't KFC, know if that would work right, with my, right. with my As we're talking about obesity, right? <laughs> don't know, I don't know. KFC, about KFC. I like maybe, it. Maybe the naked one, right? Not the fried chicken with the, you know, <laughs> the maybe naked strips. I think those are Popeyes, right? Naked. I think you get the, the I don't yeah, know. I can't know true. I got my chicken <laughs> all mixed up. But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. But yeah, I think that this is so good, right? And this is so yeah. important because as you said, we get very little training about nutrition. Like I think nutrition was like two weeks, right? Um, so <laughs> So You've where do we send our patients? Right. I think, I think, okay, yeah, I so, think yeah, so, like so absolutely. So, so the um, question becomes, so I certainly try to counsel my patients. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I certainly try to counsel my patients. I look at treating MS as a very holistic approach, right? We look at what the person does as well as what the medicines do. I always say there's a right. part you play, there's a part medicine plays. No medicine does everything right to treat That's all like of your conditions. Yeah. Exactly. So there's so many parallels here, which is really exciting yeah, to me. Yeah, um, I never even thought but, about it until we we're doing this conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so, so, how do we, or where should people go for resources, Absolutely. right? So, let's say, yeah. you know, that person who is struggling with their weight, you know, <laughs> or where should they go for resources, and where should their Absolutely. physicians refer them, right? You know, since yeah. we don't have obesity medicine specialists everywhere, like who should we be sending people to see to kind of help guide them through well, this journey? Well, we now know that, oh, so there are only about 50 of us that are now fellowship trained in obesity in the country, but there are now over 5,000 physicians that are board certified in obesity. So the numbers are growing. It just grew by another 1,000 uh, just maybe about a month or two ago when the American Board of Obesity Medicine released their latest um, people that it passed the board exam. So 
what you can do if you, and this is free, you don't have to pay anything to do this. You can go to www.abom, so alpha, bravo, I don't know what the O and M are <laughs> for those of the, the um, Z, um, and then if you go to abom.org, you can look up a physician by zip code and you can see physicians that are certified by the American Board of Obesity Medicine in your area. And you'd be like, oh, I had no idea. There's someone like right down the street. That's a good place to go. So you know these people that are um, specifically catered towards addressing obesity within the population. That's number one. Number two, um, I think they're great resources. I wrote a book called Facing Overweight and Obesity, A Complete Guide for Children and Adults. Um, that's on Amazon. So if you have Amazon Kindle Unlimited subscriber, it's free. For those of you who aren't, then there obviously is a fee to get to it. But my goal is to cover obesity across the life course. As an internist, as a pediatrician, I take care of patients between the ages of two and 90. And yes, I take care of some families where I'm taking care of four generations. Um, and what we may be doing for those different people along those generations from child to parent to grandparent to great grandparent may be very different, but my messaging is the same. This is a disease, it's a highly heritable disease. We know that weight is more heritable than height, meaning that if parents have obesity, the likelihood their children will struggle whether or not you optimize what you're doing here once they're actually born and, and be living beings is on the order of 55 to 85% likelihood of having the disease of obesity. That's even with how are, you can be, you can be doing 20 hours of exercise. You can be, you know, eating the, the only organic foods grown in your garden, all of these things. It's highly heritable, more heritable mm. than what height. So, you know, we learn mid parental for the uh, the physicians that are out there, we learn mid parental height, right? We, we calculate that on our PEDS rotations that we're like, oh yeah, and we do this. I think that, you know, you guys don't be selling this for me. I'm gonna take credit and it's, it's recorded. Let's I see. think we need a mid parental weight, right? Why can't we have a mid parental weight? And so then we know, hey, what is the weight status of our of our kids? I need to come up with this quickly because I'm putting this out there. You do. The whole you point do. Is, don't worry. Is I won't steal. There's, you won't steal it. But I know there's nah. some people. I, see. I don't. I can't I'll see you guys, you. but I feel like I'll you're listening. You. <laughs> but no, this is really important because you know we we have to recognize how families play a role, um, and it's not to blame the parent. It's just to say, okay. We know this is increases the risk. All right, so let's let's address it. And so those are key things. So abomb.org, I think my book, Facing Overweight and Obesity, um, and then, you know, really making sure that we know that there's this is a chronic disease that requires chronic treatment. And like you just said, Dr. Williams, the medications don't work without some of the work you're doing. So people are like, hey, I want to just throw in a medicine. Okay, yeah, that's I'm happy to start a medicine, but there's never been a medicine that's been tested outside of making lifestyle modifications, right? So the, right. The, the, the medicines are complementary. They act on different parts of the brain. So getting back to how the similarities, we need to do a paper on that, you guys. We do. On, I on know. The, on the, right? Wheels are turning. But it acts on I the know. brain, right? So let's get, if we know that these medications act on different parts of the brain to bring weight down, if you stop the medicine, what happens? Your weight returns, right? So the key thing is, is that if we use a medication, much like an MS, you don't just stop the medicine and be like, oh, there's no MS anymore. It just went away. No, that's not how that works. It's very mm -hmm. similar to obesity. If the medicine works, if it works, because I know that you guys have a lot of trial and error for finding the right regimen for a patient. It's similar mm -hmm. for us. I have to find the right drug regimen. And if it works, hey, let's hold Let's hold. Now that may change over time. Something may happen and we may have to change and add or modify. That's fine. But that's exactly the way we approach it in obesity medicine. Awesome. Awesome. So we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So, man, this this is so juicy. Like I could sit here and talk juicy. to you guys forever. Ooh. But, you know, everybody, um, you know, does have to go to bed at some point. <laughs> uh, so let's just take a couple of questions. Please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. I'm going to put the first one up on the screen. All righty. So this person said eating yourself thin is a term often used, but with people who achieve this, uh, seem to end up, but people who have achieved this seem to end up unhealthy again. Why is this the case with a lot of people? Oh, Terry, I got you. I got you. This is metabolic adaptation. So remember, and so I'm going to just use it like this. I'm going to start using car. My dad trained me like I was a boy. So I'm just going to sound like I'm talking to guys, but um, this is what happens. Think of your body as like a gas tank. And let's say you're a patient or a person, uh, everybody's a patient, you're a person that has always had more excess weight. Your gas tank is the size of like a tractor trailer. 
Now you may have some really little people and that's great. My husband will put him in this category and his gas tank is the size of a Prius, right? So he has a Prius <laughs> gas tank and then we have like a tractor trailer gas tank. Now he might try to like eat to gain weight. I mean, he doesn't do that, but let's say he tried to eat again. He, then he's like finding that, you know, but his gas tank won't go much higher. So his kind of brain keeps him in this small status. The same happens for obesity. So when you have a tractor trailer size gas tank, and you're like, oh, well, let me lose weight. And you go into some strict diet that's not sustainable over the life course. You drop weight acutely, but the brain is not fooled. It goes back to fill the tank. How does it do that? It knows that it's going to bring those hormones back to either cause you to eat, to store more. You may eat half of a donut and now you store all of that where the other person you know, doesn't have that issue. So it's gonna do whatever it happens. So let's think about like the biggest loser. You guys remember that show that came on? Mm -hmm. And I always ask you guys, so we'll ask people like how much, and I'll ask Dr. Williams and Dr. Mori here, what percentage of those patients on the gas, um, on the um, Biggest Loser regained their weight? Just curious what you guys think. It's, it's, it's actually published in the literature by the NIH. 95. 96. You're so close. She got, she got 96%. What? So let's talk about why that happens. On average, when they went into the show, their resting metabolic rate was about 3000 calories, right? They all had severe obesity, 3000 calories. They did strict something that can't be maintained. Nine to 10 hours of exercise a day, severe caloric restriction, it brought them down, okay? It brought them down, but what did their resting metabolic rate, which is how much they burn at rest and activity, it went from 3000, just burning that, to 800 calories. So if they eat 801 calories, Dr. Williams, what happens? They don't store it. They're going to store it. They're going to gain weight. They're going to come back very quickly because the brain knows. The brain is like, what in the heck are you doing? Nine hours a day of working out? That's ridiculous. You can't maintain that forever and you don't. And so mm -hmm. the brain does what it wants to do. It brings it back. It fills the gas tank back up. So it wasn't their fault. Their brain remembered they were 300 pounds. They got wow. to 190 and the brain's like, no, that's not where we're supposed to be. Let's let's work to get back up here. And then it comes back. Often it surpasses that. Right now they're 305 or 310. And then you're like, well, how does that happen? Because the brain gets upset. It's mad at you. It's going to punish you. Weight cycling. When you lose weight and gain weight, you usually come to a point that's even higher than higher where you than started. The last time. Because the brain is like, oh no, look at no. You think you're you think you're smart. I'm smarter because the brain is the smartest organ, right? And so here we go back to the brain. The brain is, is doing what, so that's what happens. It's, un, wow. it's unhealthy and it's not sustainable. So when patients come in, they're like, well, what diet should I go on? I'm like, none. <laughs> well, what do you mean? And I'm like, because I want you to do something that you can sustain, sustain. forever. So it seems right? like that's the forever. key, right? The key is something sustainable. So I've been sharing on um, Instagram, my weight, you know, my journey, you know, since I had COVID, my husband and I were working to get healthy and walking and things like that before I got COVID. But it took me a very long time to build my exercise tolerance up, you know, after I got sick. And so now we're walking like two, three, well, he walks five miles, I walk two miles, you know, but, um, but yeah, but we were talking about that, you know, the fact that, um, you know, the exercise is what really maintains, but basically we want to do something that's sustainable, right? Because yeah, I've tried every kind like of diet and you just, you just pop back up. So if I can't do it, do it forever, I'm not going to do Just it. don't do it. Like if you think it's like something like if you're a runner and you like running 10 miles a day or five miles a day, and that's what your thing is, and that's what you do. I mean, I'm not saying it has to be every day, but th that's something that you'll do and you'll continue to do it. I mean, right. Mitzi went to college with me. She knows that I was a big exercise enthusiast. Then I used to get in my dorm room. We had VHS yes. back then. And I would do yes. my grind, MTV grind workouts Absolutely. back in the, in the 90s. So there, there's not really any difference. That's just something that, so, you know, here we are. We won't, obviously you can add how many years A little that bit is. later. Just We're a little still, bit later, you know, like 21, two to three 21 years, plus, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just a couple we just graduated from college. And a it's the same, it's the same, but that's, but that's part of just like who I am. And so it feels comfortable to me. That's not everyone. And so I don't ever right. force my regimen on someone else because that's not, that's not where they are. I say, I try to say like, well, what exercise do you like to do? Many say, I don't like anything. I was like, okay, wait a minute. So <laughs> do you like to walk? And they're like, oh, I kind of like walking. Okay. Well then that's your thing. That's your go-to Let's make that where you are. I don't need you to go and do the craziness that I do, which Mitzi's seen. That's not, that's not where we're not going to do that. That's not going to be sustained for you. You're going to maybe hurt yourself the first day and then, then you're out for another six months or a year. That's mm -hmm. not the way we want this to go. Similarly. Mm -hmm. So I got to address surgery because I, 
I, I will be remiss not to do this. And I promise there's I'll a question over about and surgery and weight loss procedures too. Mm -hmm. so oh, okay. Well then I'll, I'll be quiet then. Okay. Well then I'll, I don't know. I want to answer that. I'll wait for that. I'll well, wait. Before, I'll before we go to the last couple questions, Dr. Mori, tell us about some of your approach since you deal with this specifically related to MS. Tell us about your approach in um, counseling your patients and, you know, some of the things that you've seen that have been successful for your patients with MS. Well, I mean, I won't pretend to say that I'm trained in obesity medicine and know exactly what the right things to do are, but things that I really start to think about are the fact that we know, for example, that sleep disorders are overrepresented in people with MS. And at least based on my understanding, illnesses like obstructive sleep apnea can actually cause weight resistance, right? Um, so when people are concerned about their weight or whatnot, you know, I usually start to do some screening questions about sleep and sleep quality. And I send a lot of people to get sleep evaluations and a ton of people have um, undiagnosed sleep apnea. And, you know, these are the kinds of things that we can sort of chip away at to improve metabolic health, um, as well as quality of life, because it stinks if you don't feel well rested for all of us, never mind when you have MS on, on board and all the MS related fatigue as well. So I think that's an important component. You know, exercise, I always tell people exercise is not going to cause you to lose weight, but <laughs> it is really important for the health of your nervous system. We know that people who exercise in midlife are less likely to develop other neurodegenerative conditions, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and things like that. Plus, it's a great treatment in the short term for people with MS to reduce anxiety and improve sleep quality and reduce fatigue. So I think that exercise is something I think of as an independent lifestyle factor, not specifically related to a treatment for obesity per se, but important for your overall health and the health long term of the brain. And then I, as a not obesity certified individual, really try to focus on dietary health more generally. I try not to talk about numbers or specifically about weight loss, but just to talk about at least to start on a conversation about what are the kinds of things you're eating? You know, are you eating a lot of processed and junk food, sugar sweetened beverages? Can we get you to eat more vegetables and fruits? Can we, you know, take out, do less takeout, do less fast food, that sort of thing. Um, and then I often do refer people back to their primary care doctor. You know, we have some nutritionists in the area who can help people. Some, some of us just don't ever really learn, I guess doctors included, right? Like what is a healthy diet and how to cook and prepare food. So um, I, I'm definitely going to be looking on the abomb.org because now I want to find some partners who can be a little bit more specific in approaching obesity as a disease. But those are the kinds of things I talk about. And I, I used to focus on BMI, this mythical like weight to height ratio, but now I kind of ignore that to some extent. And I just start to talk more about the components of a healthy lifestyle. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we'll take one more question and then, um, uh, then we can wrap up. So this is so good. We're going to have to do a part two ladies. This is so good. Okay. Okay. So, so last question. Um, no, that is not what I meant to do. That was wow. <laughs> Okay. Well, so I, while you're doing that, I want to say to Dr. Mori, the, um, the key go-to person at Hopkins, one of my favorites that we've published together, Dr. Kim Gazune, um, G-U-D-Z-U-N-E, um, who has just recently started the fellowship program in obesity medicine at Hopkins. Um, brilliant mind. Um, so just a key person to, you know, in your, in your area. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Last question. What crucial questions or conversations should we ask our PCP to help us with overcoming obesity? So I think this is a good one to end on. Yeah. Um, except that I'm going to just talk about surgery. So I think the key thing is that, <laughs> um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I would say approach your doctor, you know, say, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about my excess weight. Do you have strategies that we can entertain um, to help address my disease of obesity or something of that sort. But what I mentioned to you earlier is that may, your doctor may feel uncomfortable, meaning because they have received limited training, if you find that there's some discomfort, then I want you to go back to that resource of like finding people that are able to help you because of their additional training in obesity. Um, don't be discouraged if that your primary care isn't that person. Like I said, it's just that we don't receive training in any of our medical schools. We all went to different medical schools. 
Um, it doesn't matter where you went, if you went to Harvard, you know, I mean, if they spent time with me, they learned, but if they didn't, they took, believe it or not, they took it out of the curriculum here at Harvard about four years ago, which I don't think is a backward step, but whatever. So um, the whole point is, is that, you know, you want to say, hey, I have this excess weight. I've tried X, Y, and Z. This hasn't been effective. Do you have some additional tools that are available for me? And like, I will throw in the surgery piece. The key thing about surgery is that people wonder how it works. I talked about the brain. And actually when someone undergoes bariatric surgery for the treatment of moderate to severe obesity, there is the key thing that happens is the change in the brain gut connection. So for example, ghrelin, which is a hormone housed in the stomach, um, also in the hypothalamus, the, one of the parts that we take out or bypass, depending upon which surgery you have, is ghrelin, ghrelin, which tells us that we're hungry. Ghrelin tells us the more ghrelin you have on board, the hungrier you are. After surgery, we immediately change that pretty quickly. So that's one of the hormones that changes very quickly. Um, there are several different hormones and we could do a whole lecture. We don't have time for that. But the whole point is, is that it's the best tool that we have for the treatment of moderate to severe obesity because it immediately changes that brain gut connection and brings your set point down here. But it's not a panacea, you guys. It doesn't solve obesity. It's a it's a mm -hmm. tool in the toolbox, and mm -hmm. it may need to be supported with additional tools like medications or whatever once we get to that low point. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to bring that into the perspective because yeah. I find particularly amongst Black women, which is the group that has the highest levels of obesity, that there's this reticent to consider surgery, not recognizing that it's the best tool for those that have that size of a problem. Mm-hmm. Okay, two more questions because these are really good. All okay. right. Um, are these diets worth it or a waste of money? So can I can I I'll go first and I'll let Dr. So I think diets, unless I told you anything that's not sustainable, you know, what's the point? Um, if it's something that you feel like is exactly what Dr. Morey said, which is looking at the process of the foods. I want your foods to look like they look in nature, i.e. Kentucky Fried Chicken doesn't really look like anything in nature, right? <laughs> Listen, let me let me tell you about intimidation. Going to a meeting and sitting and eating next to Dr. Cody Stanford, I was like, oh, should I get a cookie? Is she going to talk about me? Everybody gets so Is she scared be to analyzing my plate? Oh my I promise God. I'm not doing it. You know, I think everything in moderation. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't so like she got fried dessert, chicken, so I got but, some. you know. Yes. <laughs> But the key thing is process. You know, the thing is, is that, you know, the minute, the, the less process, the better for your brain. But just because you have a completely clean diet does not mean, like I said, that you won't have obesity. Some people will still store more and it, it's not your fault. That's even more, you know, you know, information to support that it's not your fault. Like that for some reason, diet alone is just not an effective tool for you. And it's OK. That's very common. Um, but the goal is less process is better going on a diet that you're not planning on continuing for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, what's the point? That's yeah. my thing. Dr. Murray, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you. No, I totally agree. I'm glad to hear that you, uh, you believe in moderation because I think sometimes, you know, if we have a goal that's too lofty, even if it's something that we think we can reach, um, I don't know, making the change too fast is makes it not not doable. So I always try to aim, aim for one little change at a time. And, you know, it's not that you can never if family pizza night is your thing, you know, every once in a while, I'm like, go for it. But it shouldn't be right. the majority of your food. I, I don't, Maybe mm -hmm. I'm right or wrong. I'm like, well, maybe no, try I to agree. aim towards like an 80% kind of thing where you're like, mostly eating healthy food and mostly eating whole foods and things like that. Yeah. I want to tag on to that point that she just yes. made, which I thought was extremely important, which is um, that's why I don't let patients tell me that they have their goal weight also. So when they tell me I want to lose a hundred pounds, I like totally ignore them because what if they lose 64 pounds? Yeah. If awesome. they set a hundred as their goal, they're going to always feel like they failed. I would say 64 pounds is a substantial weight loss, right? But if they mm -hmm. set 100 as their goal and they fall short of that, everything else is a failure. Mm -hmm. And so I don't yeah. let patients, I mean, they can do it in their own heads, but I tell them, they draw, well, I'm going to tell you, I'm, like, I'm not listening and I'll just do something <laughs> like that because I don't, because I don't know what their bodies are going to do. And I have to wait. Their mm -hmm. bodies give me the answer, right? Like I have mm -hmm. to listen to what is their body going to do? That gentleman that went from 550 to, to 300, 
you know, let's say I get, he said he wanted to be 245. I mean, and we lost 250 pounds. Is that a failure or is that success for him? So I think that's why I want to support mm. um, what Dr. Maury just said. Don't set these like lofty goals, because if you fall short, you're going to always feel like, oh, but if I could have just gotten to this number, whatever this arbitrary number is. Right. This is so good. So, so many parallels between obesity medicine and MS. So I learned a lot today. Um, this has been an amazing discussion. And why don't I have you ladies just kind of give us one or two final thoughts if you want to tell folks where to find you, if you're, um, you know, if you do things on social media that, you know, are open to the public or tweet, what have you, um, or tell us where to find your research or your work. Start with uh, Dr. Moore. I told Dr. Cody Stanford, I'm not a not a big social media gal, but uh, but I do have a Twitter handle, and uh, and uh, you can look up uh, my work on PubMed. <laughs> Just, okay. Uh, awesome. All awesome, right. Awesome, so awesome. um, I'm on so the the social media channels that I'm on Instagram, Twitter, um, my favorite LinkedIn. Um, you can find me at Ask Doctor Dr. Fatima F A T I M A, which you see on your screen. Um, I love to engage. I'm usually busy. I work 80 to 100 hours a week, so don't be offended if you don't hear from me. Um, sure, it's yeah. usually because I'm working. Um, but the key thing is that you can find me anywhere. I'm the only Fatima Cody Stanford anywhere in the world, so it's very easy to find all that I do. Um, I do a lot of interviews, a lot of um, publications. I published somehow, you guys, this is crazy, 39 peer reviewed articles, which last year in 2020. Um, wow. So I'm always, like, yeah, I know that was bizarre. I think it's because I, I don't know, it's just bizarre, maybe pathologic. But um, <laughs> that's also it. Bitsy knows me all too well. Um, so, yeah, so, but then just, you know, reach out. The You know, my goal is to help support. Um, and, you know, just m make sure that people get to their happiest, healthiest self. That's really my key. Awesome sauce. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for this amazing conversation. We will see everyone in two weeks for our next episode of Brain Chat with the Nerdy Neurologist. We will be talking about health equity and diversity in research. Thank you guys so much and have a wonderful night. <laughs>